Um, so you guys may be wondering where I've been. Uh, I've just been pretty busy, you know, watching 60 films in 2022, and boy, what year that has been. But you know, I've just been busy with my own personal life, and I'm I want to get back into video making, especially making content for this channel. So why don't I just shut up and show you my rankings of the films I've watched in 2022. Hopefully that will pique an interest in your next watch list. Let's get to it. We're going to start in number 10, Barbarian. I personally think it's a wonderful take on the themes of abuse and trauma. You see how each character in the story deals with it, as well as in the vi villains in the story. You know, it's not like the main characters, it's actually the villains, you know, there's, there's actually like layers and themes, uh, multiple layers into this film, which I just can't really get into one just single video. Each characters are either the victims or playing as the victim and i thought that's a wonderful take on people's traumas you know taking over them how they deal with it and either they're gonna pull it out there and say to themselves that they're the victims or suck it up and actually deal with it and then you overcome from being the victim beautiful cinematography you can clearly tell there's some great inspiration and recreation of the greatest horror directors of all time sam raimi i see there's like a new form of storytelling in horror you know it's always pretty much a linear structure i'm actually pretty happy that they changed it up like it just it just cuts in the middle of nowhere and it, it was unexpected you know and i honestly believe that you should watch this movie without seeing the trailers i'm going to use some clips to like you know go over through this um review and ranking however i really recommend you watching the film without watching the trailer because i watched the film without looking at the trailer and my god i was just not expecting any of it what I love about this film is what it represents. It's a metaphor for anger, emotion that manifests itself when actions from the past are forced to be buried. I really recommend this film. It's, it's, it's one of my favorites. Coming in at number nine is Pearl. I'm just surprised that there's actually a trilogy coming out from this, and I'm, I'm just really excited for the next one coming out. First of all, Mia Goff's performance as Pearl and Maxine from both films. I really hope she gets an Oscar nomination. If she can win the Oscars, that would be fantastic. She has to get an Oscar nomination because the fact that she was combining her charm as well as her um, scary motivation of becoming a successful actress is absolutely breathtaking. I think she's she's going to become like one of the next generation's greatest um, actresses. A uh, brilliantly well-written character because from the first film you're just really confused and angered by this fucking old lady bitch and then when you get into Pearl you start to understand more of her motivation, her her reasonings why she went down to this path you know it comes down from family abuse it comes down to whatever her surroundings what um the town thinks of her how she influences others how people influence her it comes down to everything going on top of her and she just wants to push it out there and make it out there but it's absolutely crazy seeing the depth of of pearl and just executed perfectly it's it's absolutely great i love how simple the story is it's pretty much just a girl wanting to make it out there but there's just obstacles coming through her way it's it's just really simple but it's the most terrifying film out there the entire production itself actually sold this film the the design the costumes the color grading the cinematography the props everything is in support of the story and i absolutely love that it was pushing the story forward it's just terrifying seeing that there's like a bright poppy future ahead of them but they have to go down to this path of absolute destruction of themselves i absolutely love this film i really hope mia goth gets an oscar nomination out of this coming in, in number eight is the northman now the scale itself is absolutely huge i mean the fact that they have actually bring the definition of north mythology into this film when you see this film you're seeing norse mythology you know through the scale through the production design costume design the grimy tone of like the basically the reality of this world it was it was absolutely well well executed the religion the symbol the symbolic um messages in it the north man pretty much steps it up it has a very simple a very familiar story it's a story that we've all seen before a basic revenge story 
that's just my only problem with it. Is that it's the same story that we've seen before. I don't think it beats The Lighthouse because that was just a completely different film to compare to this one. Absolutely, the actors they brought their air game on this. Abs beautiful cinematography. I'm basically in love with this film. It's absolutely fantastic. But I'm actually happy that the characters that are very well written, you actually want uh, the main character to succeed. You want him to kill the man that killed his father. I absolutely really enjoy this film and couldn't recommend to anyone else. It's a fantastic film. Coming in at number seven is On the Count of Three. The dark sense of humor is actually, I think I maybe because I'm just in love with that kind of humor, it kind of wins me over. All the actors did a wonderful job in this film. Um, I think the main two characters, as well as actors, they work well, well with each other. The chemistry is fun to watch, very engaging. And it's just it's just refreshing to see that kind of humor again in these films. I feel like that's kind of dying down or maybe a bit as sensitive in this world, especially in this world right now. Uh, it's kind of upsetting not to see that sense of humor anymore. It's simple character developments with these characters, especially the main two, who basically the main point of the story is that they made a promise to each, to each other that they're going to kill themselves at the end of the day. But it doesn't go well, you know, it's between them two. It's this friendship that keeps them together, that pushes them forward in life, yet they're going to end up dying together. They're going to end up promising to kill each other. I don't know, there's something, there's something, there's something bittersweet about that. I love it. Coming in at number six is Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery. It's absolutely stupid. I'm so happy that the filmmaker Ryan Johnson acknowledged how stupid this mystery is. I'm happy of how serious the first film was and how funny this film is. I'm glad that he took that comedic tone and that path to making uh, this one. I'm actually, the fact that you immediately understand that this is actually far more funnier than the first film, you can take this serious mystery side away and acknowledge like, oh wow, this film is funny, the mystery is meant to be stupid. That's the whole point of this film. It's stupid fun. That's all it is. All the cast and the characters are absolutely very engaging to watch. I thought that Mong Block is clearly a top tier character to watch. I'm glad that Hugh Grant is married to him. <laughs> it is true. I'm married to James Bond. <laughs> oh fuck man, I didn't know that. Yeah. Coming in in number five is Jackass Forever. I absolutely love the Jackass uh, franchise. I I actually have um, actually have the Jackass uh, Uncut uh, TV and movie collection. I absolutely love this. It's, it, I, it's, it's probably one of my favorites. Definitely better than Fast and the Furious. My only issue with this film is the finale. I feel like they could have done something that would make me feel like it's the movie of the year. It, it, I don't know. It's just obviously it was missing that one guy that um, oh, I forgot his name, but he flips out the confetti and says, oh, God, thank God it's over. And then he whips out at the end. I feel like they could have pushed the ending more. Like I think something else should, could have happened. But every, but all the other stunts, all the people that were there, it, they're just so fun to watch. Honestly, it's really fun. But everything else about this film was absolutely awesome, and I could watch that film over and over and not get tired over it. Except for the finale, it kind of sucked. Coming in number four, the Batman cinemat. <laughs> Sorry, I wrote down on my book. I wrote down on my book cinematography of porn. I mean, that's all. <laughs> I mean, this film's fucking. Like, I could just imagine some fucking weird snob masturbating over this film. Just how fucking good looking the show. Just oh, look at this. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, what I really love about this film is that. It's literally doing what the title says. It's focusing more on the Batman, the character himself, rather than the Bruce Wayne. Uh, while a lot of people don't like that aspect, I think it's a pretty understandable uh, take and why Matt Reeves actually went along with this character. The first film is dealing is dealing with Bruce struggling to being Batman, and by the end of this film, he discovers that Bruce Wayne can help the city more than ever than Batman. I love the detective aspect. I think that was like the only thing I was missing from the Dark Knight trilogy. Oh, well, there was, I think there's a couple, but I don't know. It just, it just, it hits different to this film. It really does. I love that we get to see um, like a final, like a, like an actual detective story of Batman. It was, it was actually amazing seeing him looking for the clues and how they match up and actually solving the mystery. That's like the one thing I wanted to see in a Batman film. All the characters and the cast were fantastic. 
great, cinematography was great, and the score, poor. Oh, so good, too good. Coming in at number three is The Fablemans. Yep, a Steven Spielberg film about himself. Yep, it's not really about himself. You know, it's just about a kid that wants to make films and his life says no. <laughs> No, but I don't know. I just, I guess I just relate to this character and the story too much. You know, I want to make films the same as uh, Sam Fableman. And yeah, he's literally me. <laughs> the one thing I have an issue with is just those common, uh, those um, coming of age tropes. You know, the high school bullies, the uh, um, parents. I don't know. It's, it's been done before. And I think Steven does a really good job of implementing that on the main message and the theme of this film it does kill the engagement from me because you're done just like that it kills the engagement from me because i feel like oh i know what's gonna happen but you know he does kind of pull some turns of the story but overall i think it was just engaging and absolutely and the one thing i actually love about this film is that there are more scenes with no dialogue and you're just seeing people watching Sam's films. I think that's like the one thing that I wanted to see in like a film like this, like a film about a kid making films is what are, what are his parents reaction to this? What are the, his friends reaction to this? What are, shut the, f what are the, his audience reacting to his work what are they like and what is his reaction to the audience i think that's like the perfect example of how to make a film about film i really do it coming in number two is nope i say yep <laughs> No, but everything about this film was actually awesome. I actually I watched this on IMAX and I absolutely just loved everything about it. The characters are so engaging. I love the mystery and the ambiguous symbols and messages across this film. This isn't Jordan Peele's best. I don't think he'll ever beat um, Get Out. I think Get Out is a great film. The one thing that just like pulls me out of it is the chimpanzee story. That's like the one thing that kind of like pulled me out of it is that it's not really telling the main story but i do understand why it's there it's basically giving us more depth of one of the characters in the film and i don't think it was needed but i do understand why he put it there but everything else about this film was great fuck off now ladies and gentlemen coming in number one is everything everywhere all at once now, I think it's pretty obvious why this film is number one. The special effects alone is just groundbreaking, breathtaking, outstanding. Everything about, funny that I said that word, everything about the special effects is incredible. I watched this on IMAX the first time watching it and I absolutely loved it. I love how emotional the film gets from scene to scene. Knowing that the world is filled with opportunities, you can do anything you want. Nothing matters. That's the whole point of this film is that nothing matters. I love, that's why I love about this film. All the characters are amazing. I love how out of film standard this film is because usually when they deal with like mother and daughter relationships it's usually focusing on the daughter and viewing the mother as the villain in most movies holy shit but the daughter is the villain and the mother is the hero and obviously they're not really they don't want to push that thing where um i forgot the the name of the daughter Fucking ringtone death, please fuck off. But the idea is that. I'm just gonna pause for a fucking second. Shut up! This is probably the best, I think, investment you in, in a movie in this year, I reckon. Like, I think emotionally it's gonna get you no matter what even if you don't cry you're crying inside that's what i reckon that's what i reckon seeing each of the characters have their own moment throughout this film you understand that it's becoming more than just her the mother it's the whole family it's it's just her accepting her life as what it is and keeping with that and seeing the benefits and the strength of her character is i absolutely love this film now you may be wondering where are the, your other films since you've watched 60 films. Here are the rest of the films that I've ranked and watched. 
I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. I'm going to make some music while movie posters appear, then my ratings over there and the number they're in until I get to my top five worst films of 2022. <laughs> Hope I made that. Um. <laughs> Uh, hey everyone, I wasn't really planning on doing a big uh, major setup for the fucking top five worst films. About my phone, I've got my films here. So for top 56 is Blonde, literally just retold the whole story about Marilyn Monroe in absolute, it is absolutely fake. It's not true and pretty much retells stupid traumas of her, it's, it's dumb. Uh, 57, Orphan, First Kill, pretty bland. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, there was just nothing going on, really. It doesn't bring anything new to the first movie. Um, just, just boring. Just nothing happened. Uh, next one, 58. Uncharted. If you're a fan of Uncharted, you already know that it sucks major balls. Acting is horrible, especially from Mark Wahlberg. He didn't even try. Didn't even try. 59. Morbius. I mean, did, I, I just realized, I just... I forgot that that film came out that year. Is that just me? Like, I just completely forgot about it. Anyway, 60. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone heard this. Hot Take The Depth Slash Heard Trial. It's exactly what you think it is. The worst part is that everybody knows the trial. Everybody's seen it. They broadcast it. So there's really no point of making a movie out of it. Um, if you watch the trailer, you've basically seen the movie. If you watch the trial, you've already seen the movie. <laughs> That's all. Stay tuned uh, later while I'm making a new video on my anticipated films coming out this year, 2023. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. Do what you love. Have fun.